And uh, Matt is going to present her studies, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Probably the committee will chime in, and then we'll open it up uh, for everyone to have more uh, any comments, suggestions. Uh, then the committee will huddle again, and uh, we'll come back in. So that's kind of how it will progress. And some of the uh, members do have to leave by three, so we'll try to kind of stay on that time table. Okay. Thank you, Reverend. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. It's so exciting for me um, to see so many familiar faces from so many different parts of my trajectory, um, of my time here, and even in my preparation to come here. Some folks who I knew beforehand have come out, so I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me, because um, this is definitely a collaborative effort. I feel like both professionally, a lot of my colleagues and collaborators are here, as well as personally, and a lot of you have offered me maybe not collaboration, but personal support, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to talk about my dissertation work, which is on residential energy feedback. Um, so this is kind of just to prepare you. We're going to go over a lot of material in a very short amount of time. Um, so, and I'm not going to go into a lot excruciating detail on every single study because there is so much of it. We're talking about a couple hundred pages with four empirical studies. Um, so I'll welcome questions at the end, but I might not answer every, address every little thing. Um, so I'm going to kind of introduce the topic and theory. Then I'm going to talk about four specific empirical studies that are included in the dissertation and then conclude with kind of the directions that I'm going in right now. But I wanted to start with just kind of the ideas that brought me to this research as well as to um, coming here to pursue a PhD at UC Irvine. And I had kind of three underlying ideas, things that were really drawing me to uh, quit my job as a high school activities director, my former principal is here, um, and, and get a PhD and study big, big, these big picture questions. And they were this. The first one was that technology and new media were significantly changing how we interact with our natural built and social worlds. So from cell phones in Central Africa to multi-person chat rooms in Ames, Iowa, the way that we're interacting with each other and with the natural world is changing in significant ways. We're all aware of that. And it seemed that there was a lot of research um, in psychology and a lot actually being conducted here at UCI on some of the serious implications of that and the problems and concerns about that. And while I don't disagree with them, I also thought there was another story to be told, and that was that there are a lot of potential opportunities to leverage these changes for pro-environmental and pro-social benefit. So while it is true that technology can serve to disassociate and disconnect us from one another and from the natural environment, I thought it could also be used to connect us. And finally, there is a lot of work doing that in the private sector right now, but there wasn't as much being addressed empirically within the, the social sciences. And I thought a social scientific and specifically a psychological or social ecological approach is really important for two reasons. It provides a theoretical base with which to study this potential so we can apply things we know from other behavioral domains to this new media landscape, as well as sets of empirical methodology with which to study this potential. Um, and so coming into those Based on those three ideas, I started to approach my work and ended up forming a research lab here at UC Irvine um, in the Center for Unconventional Security Affairs with Richard Matthew um, called the Transformational Media Lab. And the idea of the lab in general is to study how technology and new media are changing and can be leveraged to affect how we interact with one another and with the built and natural environment. And there's two broad areas that, I, that we conduct this work in the lab. And my dissertation focuses on the first, home energy management. And this actually represents the very first thing I started studying when I got to UC Irvine. So it was only fitting that it encompassed my entire dissertation rather than just become a part thereof. So when we look at home energy management, I'm really looking at the role of home energy management in addressing a big problem. So there's this big problem out there that some of us have heard about called climate change. I'm not going to talk about it in much detail. If you're not familiar with it, feel free to talk to me afterwards. Um, but we know, 97% of scientists currently agree, upwards of, that the amount of uh, greenhouse gases and carbon being emitted into the atmosphere is rising, and it's largely due to our behavior. And that rising, do you see that rising? Um, that rising. Uh, carbon emissions are largely due to energy, electricity, power generation, as well as our use in buildings. 
And a recent study by McKinsey identified energy efficiency as a significant, vast, low-cost energy resource while we are hard at work, we being not me, but scientists, developing alternative energy sources. Energy efficiency is also a source, and it's the cheapest source of new energy. And they've identified a trillion dollars in savings, a gigaton of greenhouse gas a year. And there are two other kind of quotes I thought were really great. Um, one by former Energy Secretary Stephen Chu, who says, energy efficiency is not the low hanging fruit. It's the fruit laying on the ground waiting to be picked up. It's right there. And this actually, as I was preparing my slides yesterday, I got an email from Climate Resolve. I think this might be my favorite definition ever of energy efficiency, and they said that it is the Swiss army knife of public policy. It is indeed veg o -matic. No matter the question, it just might be the answer. Um, and I just couldn't help but include that in my in my slides today. Um, and they did, this McKinsey study said the residential sector accounts for over a third of this potential. So in our homes, we can be addressing, we can be reducing our emissions twice the size we could reduce twice the annual emissions of Scandinavia is basically what the potential reductions, according to, according to this McKinsey study on energy efficiency. And they've identified a number of different behaviors and a number of different actions that can be done to reach that potential, that potential um, a third of a gigaton of greenhouse gas a year. But they did identify some significant barriers to meeting this potential. Those significant barriers largely are people. Um, they found, and we know that energy from other studies, that energy use in identical homes with identical things in the homes vary by up to 260%. So two people living in the same house can have very different ecological footprints. And so it's important that we not only address the technological, but also the psychological. And the cool thing is, psychology really does study people. So social science, and we think of psychology as largely clinical sometimes in the popular sphere, but we are studying mental process and behavior. And the subfield, environmental psychology, um, specifically looks at the study of human well-being, human behavior, in relation to our socio-physical environment. So not just studying behavior within the lab, but how we're living within our local environments. And I thought this was great when the National Academies of Science defined the emerging field of sustainability science. They specifically said it was the emerging field dealing with interactions between natural and social systems. So we're seeing even within the broader sustainability sphere that social solutions are being seen as a necessary um, corollary with the physical sciences. And so when I thought about kind of the role of a psychological or social scientific approach, as I mentioned, integrating theory is really important, understanding behavior, and then identifying and testing interventions. And while my dissertation will address all three, I'm going to start at the bottom and talk about the intervention that we're focused on today, which is feedback. So feedback, a basic definition, is information about the result of a process or action that can be used in modification or control. So when you step on a scale, you might receive feedback about the number of calories you are consuming and or burning. If you clap at the end of my talk, you might provide me with some feedback about the quality of my presentation. You could also just be conveying social norms, so I have to be careful in my interpretation of that. Um, so if we and if we look at a systems if we look at a systems definition of feedback, so any time we do something, every action has some sort of response or reaction in the world, and feedback is taking some sort of measurement, collecting some sort of information about the result of an action, and providing it back to that controlling source. For the case of us, this can happen in technical systems like a home thermostat. This also happens in the natural environment, but we're talking about people. So I wanted to look at psychological theory and how feedback has been looked at in this field. And research on feedback goes back to the early 20th century, looking at knowledge of results studies and early work in law of effect and behaviorism that says the knowledge of a result can affect our future behavior. So when we do something, we get some sort of information, some positive or negative reinforcement, and that positive or negative reinforcement can be used to modify future behavior. Subsequent research expanded on that and said it doesn't necessarily have to be physical. We might get information that also we might see feedback being given social, social identification theory not here, says that we might see information being given back to a relevant peer, and that can inform our behavior as well. Um, in addition, when we set goals, 
when we get information that has a that where that feedback is given in reference to a standard, which can be a goal or the use of our neighbors or our past use, um, that that makes it more relevant. So when you weigh yourself, that tells you how much you weigh, but if you don't know how much you want to weigh, if you don't have a goal or you have a pair of pants that you want to fit into or you know what standard for your height, um, that, that might not be meaningful. So linking all of this past theory, Kluger and Denisi in 1996 wrote a meta-analysis that they published in Psychological Bulletin and they, they kind of incorporated a lot of past research that related to feedback and developed the feedback intervention theory. And they said that for feedback to be effective, there was a series of things that needed to be considered. Knowledge of results, there had to be some feedback standard gap and they also pulled in ad action identification theory that says that there are different levels of motivation that we might seek. So while when you take a test, you might think, I want to get 100 on the test. But if you already get 100, or I want to get an A on the test, but if you already have a 95, why do you want 100? You might have some higher self-relevant goals. I want to be the smartest person in the class. So once we meet kind of a basic task, I have not failed, that we can set higher goals, more self-relevant goals, so that feedback is not always just reducing a discrepancy, but can be used to stimulate us towards higher goals. Um, and feedback also serves to pull the locus of attention onto some specific thing. And Kluger and Denisi also noted that while so much of this theory applies across behavioral domains, feedback researchers have largely ignored the theoretical importance of task characteristics. So most of this research has been on feedback uh, in classrooms, on taking tests, or health behavior, very self-relevant behavior. And very little of this work, none that we could see in this psychological theory, um, had incorporated pro-environmental behavior, which we know is psychologically distinct for a number of reasons. So it seemed that it was important to think about the task characteristics of energy use and integrate those task characteristics with a broader understanding of feedback in general. And so we identified four primary task characteristics of feedback, um, which are the first that it's non-sensory. While yes, you could technically sense electricity and see and touch electricity, we typically don't experience it like this. Electricity is bound up in a cord. So we're not seeing, touching, or feeling it. And let's be honest, we're not paying that much attention to the cord. We're watching television, which leads into the second, that the, the energy use is abstract. It's kind of invisible. Um, we use things that use energy. Nobody goes home and thinks, I'm going to kick my feet up and use some electricity tonight. Right? We think, I'm going to make dinner. I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to turn on the lights. And all of those things use electricity. So they're psychologically removed. That outcome without being brought back to our attention. In addition, when we talk about watching the TV, it's not just watching TV. There are hundreds of behaviors that use energy in a given household in a given day. So, And even within one specific area, like lighting, we can look at potential different conservation behaviors, like turning off a light when you leave the room, replacing a light bulb with a CFL or LED, or setting light timers. So this is very complicated. It's not just a single behavior um, that is addressing this energy use. And it's often thought of as of low personal relevance. Here in the state of California, electricity is very inexpensive compared to other regions and also other sources of energy. And we know that um, over the past several years at least, climate change is fairly low on the list of things that Americans worry about. And this is just this year. That, um, and it stayed kind of on that bottom of the list for quite some time. So we. It, so I took these ideas and took that feedback intervention theory and wanted to integrate it with what we know about the task characteristics of environmental behavior. Um, and so kind of expanded and developed an eco-feedback intervention theory, or E-FIT theory, which builds on FIT and says that for feedback to be effective for environmental behavior, it needs to address four primary mechanisms. The first, the information needs to be perceived, right? As we say, electricity is largely abstract, invisible, untouchable, unknowable. So it needs to be presented to people that feedback, um, you're not naturally getting feedback. And so it ne you need to direct attention to an energy relevant behavior. The second is the ability to interpret or process. A lot of people don't necessarily know what a kilowatt is, what that means, how to relate it to anything that they understand. So that interpretation is really important. It's being presented in a way that people can interpret it. 
Additionally, it needs to be motivational. Either, so we know from FIT that the feedback standard gap is really important, there can be a pre-existing goal or motivation. So if you already know that you're trying to conserve in a certain area, just getting data might be motivational on its own, or it can be provided with the feedback itself. And then it needs to connect to specific actions that the user can engage in. Like we talked about that multiplicity of behaviors make feedback when it comes to environmental behavior and energy use a little more complicated. So just to put that all in perspective, let's look at a place where there's great feedback, um, great artifacts. So when we look at a grocery store, um, we don't think of it, but there's amazing information in here. This is a great information ecosystem. There are prices on everything. You have nutritional information that's been mandated by the government. This is all kind of feed forward. And in addition, when you leave the grocery store, every time you leave, you get this amazing piece of feedback called a receipt that tells you in excruciating detail how much money everything cost if you saved on a sale item. And so you know if you spent too much how to spend less the next time. What if, instead of getting this, you just went grocery shopping whenever you wanted and got a bill like this at the end of the month? It would be really hard to make actionable decisions. And that's exactly what energy feedback has looked like in the home for a little over a century. So when we look at the current bills, they're based on um, an analog meter, which requires somebody to come out and read, go back to the utility, write down a number, and you get one number with one dollar amount for an entire month. The patent was filed on that in 1888. Thomas Edison did not invent the analog meter, but he might have had a beer with the person that did. Um, this is about how old it is. And we have this window of opportunity because we are right now transitioning in the United States and really globally to a new information architecture, a smart grid, um, where these look very similar, but this smart meter is digital, wireless, and real time. So it enables provision of data immediately and larger amounts of it. And that's, been, that's not been ignored. That's been picked up by the United States White House, launched the Green Button Initiative, which says when it was announced in September 2011, consumers should have access to energy usage information. It should be downloadable, easy to read, provided by their utility. And large companies like Google and Microsoft, some of the largest tech companies in the world, got involved and said, we're going to partner with energy utilities to provide this. And both of those, two largest companies in the world, products have been discontinued in less than five years, which leads us to think, what are we missing? And so I started looking at the literature early on, right when Google Power Meter launched. I was actually in uh, my first year of my PhD taking a meta-analysis course with Joanne Frateroli, now Zinger, um, and was interested in this topic. And what I found was maybe we're not asking the right questions. And what I started to notice was that there's a lot of research looking into this question, does residential energy feedback work? But maybe we should be asking, what types of feedback are out there? How are they different? How are they similar? Which ones are more and less effective? What's going on here? What is this psychological process? Like, what's this black box in here? What's leading getting information to conserving? And then, what are the best ways to measure outcomes? And are we being consistent in the way that we're measuring outcomes? And so from that, I did four studies, conducted four studies and a few others that probably aren't in here but should be, um, but didn't fit in a couple hundred pages over the past few years to really start looking into not just is feedback effective, but how, what, types, and explore. So I'm going to talk about these. The first is uh, meta-analysis, where I wanted to develop and test theory inferentially, looking at um, what had been studied, all the studies conducted to date, what can we learn from meta-analytic procedures. The second, I wanted to look at those different types of feedback. What are all these different products? There's this new technolo technological um, ecosystem out there, but people are just calling everything feedback. And there might be a little more nuance there. Third, I wanted to look at early adopters. People who are recruited to participate in a study might not be the same people as those that are actually going out and buying these products. When I started, got really excited about this topic and started telling everyone I knew about feedback and I was studying feedback, I learned that this isn't common. 
Most people don't own these, aren't going to Home Depot and buying kilowatts and putting them in their homes. So who are these early adopters? Who's actually buying these? And are they different from the people in our studies? Can we learn something from not just experimental work, but actually looking at naturalistic users? And then finally, how are we assessing outcomes? And is it as empirical and robust as it can be? And what I noticed was a lot of this work in this area had been done in, by, uh, in practice by practitioners in gray literature. And there wasn't a lot of rigor that I was being trained in as a doctoral student in the fields of psychology and education, the way we measure and, uh, and psychometrically validate our scales. So can we start developing tools and instruments? So first, um, I conducted a meta-analysis. That's this first one. And so as I said, um, there have been tons of studies conducted, and some literature reviews had already, been, had already come out that had found that feedback on average saves about 10%. But they saw huge ranges from no effect at all to 20 plus percent. And all of these reviews were qualitative. And as I was taking in my first year of that meta-analysis class, I learned that there's a really big difference between a literature review eyeballing findings and comparing them to really statistically uh, measuring effect sizes and comparing them using inferential statistics. Um, and when I looked at those lit reviews, the findings on several of those key, of key moderators, several of those key variables that could affect feedback effectiveness conflicted between reviewers. And so somebody said feedback's better when, it's, when it lasts longer, others said when it's shorter. And so we saw these conflicts. And finally, there was very little theoretical in integration. They were just kind of presenting results. So what I wanted to do was look at all this research in a little, slightly different way, a slightly more empirical way. So collected a bunch of studies, ended up with 174 total, 69 were irrelevant or secondary analysis. We reviewed 103, ran them through some inclusion criteria, ended up with 52 papers and 42 empirical studies, coded them on variables related to the report, the setting, methodology, treatment, and then collected statistical information, um, and then tested a series of proposed moderators that I had identified from previous literature, as well as integration with um, the eFIT theory. So, looking at perception, how frequent was feedback given, what medium was it, was it a computer, was it a bill, how was, how was feedback being presented, what was the measurement, was it dollars, kilowatt hours, were there comparison messages, was there a feedback standard gap, was it a control comparison, a historical, a social comparison, was feedback combined with other interventions, with a goal, with a financial incentive, how long did the treatment last, what was the energy granularity? So was that feedback about your whole home or was it about a specific appliance or process in the home? And were information or tips given along with the feedback to help people identify specific behaviors? So here's what we found. Overall, feedback, answering that same old question once again, was effective. The average savings were 9% and the mean effect size was significant. Um, and it was actually, I think there were about 18 zeros before that one, so it was highly significant. But again, significant variability in effects. And actually, the heterogeneity, the differences in the effect sizes were more significant than the mean effect size itself. And those mean effects, those effect sizes varied from negative 0.08 to positive 0.48. So huge variability in effect sizes. So maybe we should be saying feedback can be effective, but it depends. And so we ran those moderators and found that, yes, feedback was significantly moderated by several of the proposed um, theoretically and empirically proposed moderators, including frequency, medium, comparison, intervention, and feedback duration. We also tested for, vari for study quality, were there differences in methodology that led to some of, these, some of this variability? And we didn't see study quality affecting. So things like how they were assigned, was the control group aware they were in a study? We didn't see that that introduced any statistically significant bias. We also tested for publication type, because as I said, there's a lot of gray literature in this field. We did see sample size was the only one of the non-treatment variables that was significant. Um, so when we kind of pull this back in, we saw that most of our hypothesized moderators were significant. Real-time feedback, more frequent real-time feedback was most effective. Um, feedback effectiveness increased with technological sophistication, so computerized feedback was more effective than paper-based feedback. Appliance specific that kind of connected feedback to specific actions was more effective. Comparisons, highlighting that feedback standard gap, increased effectiveness. Combination with other interventions, goals or incentives, also um, 
our hypothesis that it increased motivation. We know that it increased effect size. And then duration was really interesting because we found a curvilinear relationship for duration was such that shorter studies and longer studies were the most effective, with those in the middle being less effective, which we hypothesized that short durations engage immediate learning and long-term establishes habit and pattern. And there might be a sweet spot in the short-term and long-term, and I'll talk about that a little bit um, coming up. So um, second, I wanted to look at all these different types of feedback. Like I mentioned, there are so many different kinds of technologies out there, and I wanted to look at some of the differences. So there had been, again, some previous work that had categorized different types of feedback. But what I noticed was that there were some issues with the current categorization. One was that they really focused on the information provided and were neglecting like all these technological changes that were going on. Um, they didn't have the sophistication for, to count for diversity in available products at this end. So while we have a category for billing and one for billing with tips, when we get to all the kind of technological products, they were all kind of lumping into one or two groups. And the, these classifications weren't systematic. They were not mutually exhaustive and mutually exclusive. And then finally, and I noticed this, I was just trying to do a slide where I wanted to say how many of these products were out there. And I wasn't sure if I should say there are literally dozens of these products on the market, or if I should say there are literally hundreds of these products on the market. And that seemed like something easy to find, and I realized it didn't exist. So you couldn't even find out what's out there. So it's the equivalent I like to think of when we look at like cameras. We have this huge category for like charcoal drawings. Um, and then when we come to almost every camera that exists today, it's all lumped into like modern stuff. And so how can, if we're really trying to analyze camera effectiveness and how it increases people's connection to their children, how could we compare it if we don't have enough, you know, enough, enough kind of robustness in the way that we understand the differences? So what we wanted to know was how many products exist, what are they, how are they alike or different, and can they be categorized systematically? And this seemed really important when we realized that medium is, is a significant predictor of effectiveness, but we don't really understand the differences between these things. Is how that kind of, if you're wondering why this sounds more engineering even psychologically, I think it's important that we understand the technological differences and link that to our psychological theories about what's most effective. But if we don't even have categories, how can we do that? So again, we collected a bunch of data. Um, so we ended up spending, Chrissy, did you work on this one? Yeah, so Kristen now is here, and about, I think, six or eight students um, spent a good 10 to 20 weeks just looking for what's out there. They said, how do I, said, I want to know everything that exists. They said, how do I find it? I'm like, I don't know, use the internet. So we spent some time just collecting data, um, looking on retail websites, asking everybody we know, internet keyword searches, and we, find two, we found 259. So it was literally hundreds of these products exist. There's question one. Then we wanted to um, code and categorize them. So we looked for products that receive information about building use, provide that data back to the user, and that we had enough information that we could describe them. We ended up with 213. We coded them based on 117 identified device parameters that we grouped into 36 characteristics. And then we broke those down into six typing characteristics, which led us to this. Beautiful, isn't it? Um, our a taxonomy of feedback technology, which groups from just is feedback effective to does it have hardware? Is it a product or is it a service? Because not every feedback has a physical thing. We have utility information. So services include information platforms and management platforms like your utility company website or companies like Opower that actually just went public last month um, that work with utilities to pull information directly from your smart meter, give it to you on your phone, website, um, home computer, Facebook, so it doesn't necessarily need hardware. So that was an important categorization. Second, um, does it communicate? So something that doesn't communicate was just kind of a feedback device. So the most common that we see in the market are what are called load monitors. So a load monitor is just something that you plug into the wall. You plug something into it, and it tells you how much that thing uses. That's just a device, it's not a complex system, and appliances can sometimes have this. So an appliance can tell you exactly how much it uses versus things that are networked. And communication um, 
is required for anything to be networked. Then we wanted to see, can you control? This was really important as well. So we go from information only to management. Is the communication one way? Are you receiving information but not able to talk back? So you check your iPhone at work and it says you left your lights on and can you turn them off or can you just feel real bad all day? Right? Um, so we have information platforms, information networks, and management platforms and management networks. And in this amazing 21st century world, we can communicate bidirectionally if the technology allows us to. Then we wanted to look at where is the display. And this is really important for that perception piece that I was talking about. Can you actually see the feedback? Is it embedded? So for example, we've seen if, you're, if you use one of these load monitors to get information about your refrigerator, well, most likely, that display is going to be, might be behind the refrigerator. So you might not be able to see it. So is it embedded on the appliance or sensor? Is it autonomous? Is it some sort of like, almost like a clock in home display that can just sit out? Or is it distributed, as in it can go anywhere? So your computer, something on the web, or a web portal, or your iPhone. Also, where is the data being collected? And this is important to understand what type of information when we're talking about that granularity. An appliance monitor is giving you information about that appliance, but nothing else. Same with a load monitor. Versus things that are coming, information coming from the grid will give you information about your whole home that can be disambiguated if there's sufficient granularity. And I know some of these things are words that some of you might not be familiar with. Hopefully, my committee who's read the dissertation is familiar with the nuance of some of these things. But basically, um, when you're getting information from the grid, from your smart meter, it's just giving you information about your whole home. But theoretically, if you collect enough information, you can pull out different uses. And then finally, what's the protocol? Is the communication proprietary or not? So when we get down to these management networks where you can find out about information and turn, find out something from your phone and turn it off, is it an open protocol using that green, that green button protocol that um, the White House was talking about that I mentioned before? Or is it a proprietary system where you can only use things from that company and that company only? Are you locked into some proprietary control? Which is really important when we look, about, when we look at kind of a broader ecosystem of products. So um, we were successful. That looked maybe a little simple at the end. It took us a long time to come up with categories that were mutually exclusive and mutually exhaustive. So all 213 products fit into one of those categories and only one of those categories. And that was really important to us because a real categorization structure needs to be mutually exclusive and mutually exhaustive. We know that even though they swim in the ocean, dolphins are in fact mammals. They are not mammals and fish. And so it was important that we design something that was similarly similar. Next steps, so I'm working right now um, to try and partner with some other organizations, with some other uh, researchers and organizations to create, to go to the next step, which is what everyone wants within these categories, what's better, what's worse, what works. Um, and that's what kind of started this research because people were very interested in that, but I felt like these categories were a necessary precursor. Because if you want to know what the best camera is, which, which one of these two cameras are better, you need to know if you're looking for a camera that fits in your pocket or one that can shoot uh, low light, high quality action photography. So when we see on things like CNET, there are all these different types. This was our first step, was developing the types. And our goal is to create an interactive database and then some sort of ratings and rankings based on psychological principles of effectiveness. Next, um, I wanted to look, as I said, at who's actually buying these things. Um, because it sounds really cool when you sit in a talk like this, maybe it does. Um, this is huge, 40%, a trillion dollars in energy savings. We can save Earth. Why aren't these things flying off the shelves? Who's out there purchasing? What's going on in the real world? So there's tons of empirical, there's tons of research that suggests that if people get this, it will work. But who's using them and what's their experience? So we wanted to look at naturalistic users. People who are actively purchasing and using feedback. And we wanted to look at their naturalistic experiences. What commercial products they're buying. The differences, which ones they picked, and the full spectrum of user experience. From how did you find out about it, to how did you get it, to are you still using it, why or why not. 
And so we conducted a, um, a, a survey and we did some purposive sampling. So I was looking for people that use feedback. So we oversampled on listservs and emails and social media locations of people that we thought might be these strange early adopter minority people who are hacking into their homes and figuring out how much energy they use. And we actually did really well. We ended up with 10%. We got collected data from 836 people, 86% of them, 10% reported using energy feedback. And so we wanted to know who are these people and what is their user experience? So first we asked them a series, we asked all 836 a series of questions about who they were demographically and psychological variables. And we wanted to see, are there differences between feedback users and non-users? And we did see several significant differences within the sample between those who had and hadn't. So we saw um, most of our demographic variables, they were more likely, so feedback users were more likely to be male, older, married, um, they were slightly more liberal, um, higher income, they lived in a detached home, and they were much more likely to own their home. And that was, and that owning, at the bivariate level, owning a home and being male were the two strongest effects. And then we also looked at some psychological variables. We looked at environmental concerns, financial concerns, and social concerns, and we did find significant differences on both environmental and financial. What's interesting is we found feedback users were more environmentally concerned and motivated but less financially motivated and less price conscious. So it wasn't necessarily saving money that was, dif that was differentiating these folks. So then what we did was we took all the variables that were significant at the bivariate level and ran them in a regression to look at what variables best explain the variance between these early adopter feedback users and non-users. And we found that they were gender, home ownership, environmental motivation and financial motivation. So they were less financially motivated, more environmentally motivated male homeowners, um, which could be useful. And this is just kind of preliminary work, but building off of this, what is different about these things? This could affect how we approach market segmentation and understanding what are the barriers for people that are not these folks as well. So both it helps us identify who we can target to be those early adopters and also some people to look at that we might not be getting. And then we wanted to look at what is their user experience. So we asked those 86 who said, yes, I've used feedback. What did you use? How did you find out about it? What did you like and dislike about it? Did anything change? And do you still use it? And so when we asked what they used, we found across these categories, we found the most frequent were these load monitors, half of, almost half of them, 42 of them. Um, and we saw 86 people, but 99 reported devices. Um, because some people had reported using more than one. And if they were used more than one, we asked them to answer the questions about all of them. So when I have numbers and percents, they're pretty much the same. Um, so we found the most frequent were these load monitors, in-home displays, information platforms like utility websites and bills. A couple had used these newer management networks. And then although heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is not technically energy feedback, we were interested in self-perceptions. So we included, if they thought it was feedback, we wanted to know their perception of their thinking that they were using feedback. So people said, I use my programmable thermostat and that's feedback. Although it's not really giving energy feedback, it is giving temperature feedback. So we included those folks. We asked them, how'd you get it? And the most interesting thing here was over 30% found out via friends and family and acquired via friends and family followed by utility acquisition. I found out and got it from my utility. And a significant number borrowed their devices. So they didn't purchase them, they borrowed them. Then we asked them, what did you like and dislike about it? And we saw people really said, it, so for some of these, they're easy to use, effectiveness, interactivity. Again, this is just kind of high level across these devices. Um, but then some people talked about display problems. There's lots of hard, tiny to read numbers. It's hazardous to set up. Where I put it, I can't see the information. There's not enough storage for me to actually keep track of it. Um, and then we asked them about outcomes. And we did see that over half of them reported some sort of energy saving behavior, but a quarter said no changes. And 15% actually said they found out that they used, that certain things used less than they thought and potentially are using more. I've wound up using more energy on some devices, a potential what's called a rebound effect. In some cases, I'm less diligent than I was before. So while we see kind of what we want from some users, others, we see, oh, I don't really care about that anymore. I found out it doesn't really matter. 
And then when we asked them, do you still use it, about half, a little over half said yes. I like to check myself and make sure I'm on track. It's just kind of become a habit. But almost half said no, it served its purpose. I learned what I needed to learn. And that leads to what I thought was the most interesting um, distinction to come out of this study, which I have a, a very small separate paper I wrote just on this, which was that these kind of dual functions of feedback that we see across from motivation to product use to outcomes, that feedback can be used for tracking and learning. And so, and these are, these are actual quotes, so it wasn't that hard for me to identify. They literally used the words track and learn multiple times, right? But what we identified was that when we think about learning, learning is acquiring a bite of information in a moment. I learned that my television uses energy when it's off. I know that now. Versus tracking, which is keeping track of how much energy my home is using over time. So tracking requires many bits of information over time. How is my energy use changing? How is it different or similar to my neighbors? Learning doesn't need comparable information. I just learned something. Where tracking does require that feedback standard gap. Um, so rather than just looking at feedback as one thing, we're starting to see this nuance. And when I talked about that short and long-term duration, that weird curve linear effect in the meta-analysis, it could be that short-term feedback helps people learn, but really long-term feedback is required for that tracking, that habitual use to come into play. Um, and additional things that we thought were interesting, which I kind of mentioned, from those differences, we, that there's a lot of information that we can kind of drill into for market segmentation. This was one of the first studies um, on looking at actual users and who, are, who is this potential market and who's not. Social diffusion, so looking at leveraging social networks because over 30% are engaging socially. This idea of diminished utility, some people, almost half of them aren't using it, it served its purpose. So we can look at lending programs from utilities or libraries or even lending these, as well as what to do about that rebound effect that, uh, found out electricity's cheap, right? Uh, didn't use that much. Um, and then last, uh, like I said, we wanted to look at what I noticed was that every study was collecting similar data in slightly different ways. So when asking about behaviors, some would say, what have you done to save energy? Others would say, are you saving energy now? Some would say, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much less energy are you using? Some would say, here's a list of 10 behaviors, which ones have you engaged in? Others, here's a list of 12 behaviors, which ones have you engaged in? And as a psychologist, I knew that that's not ideal, um, but nobody, there were no real uh, scales or validated instruments. So this is the first one that we developed, and I'm working with some colleagues on building from this. But we wanted to look at usability, at like how easy is it? User experience is about users, right? So what is the user experience? Is it easy to use, engaging, effective, efficient, easy to learn? How, what is the people's experience of using this? And the most widely, when I started looking into usability, the most widely used scale by a factor of I don't know what is called the system usability scale. It was developed in 1986. And it's used for systems. I think I would like to use this system frequently. I found the system complex. I found the various functions in this system were well integrated. So the question seemed a little clunky for what I was going after. So I thought this could be tweaked a bit. And so I looked at what else was out there. And I found some similar issues. And these were those issues. They were designed primarily to evaluate products or systems rather than information. So we could kind of address the unique needs of eco-feedback. And these metrics were primarily associated with ease of use. And there was less focus in the past um, scales on, use of, on engagement. So I wanted to validate subscales for both ease of use and engagement. So we designed a short, a quick and dirty, um, eight question scale which with four for ease of use, four for engagement. The ease of use questions were designed to get at complexity, interpretability, and learnability, which are identified in past mm -hmm. literature as components of ease of use. And the engagement relevance, relevance, usefulness, and intention to use. And so we tested it online with a little over 1,000 people. And this was part of a larger study. There are a couple other. Um, this was the outcome variable that we used in a study where we were asking about framing, messaging, and info visualization. Um, we got a fairly representative sample. They are a little bit younger than the, than, uh, than the census, um, with slightly more education, but somewhat uh, representative. And we tested for four psychometric properties. Which are, called, which are factor structure, reliability, criterion, validity, and sensitivity. So factor structure is 
did the ease of use questions kind of cluster together as ease of use? And did the engagement questions kind of cluster together as engagement? And they did. We had a real clean break. Um, now I'm presenting the, the eight that worked. We tested like 12 or 13 of them. But we did see that four real clean ones came out on ease of use and four on engagement. And then we looked at reliability, which is, as a whole, do these, do these all kind of test something, a thing? And we found both the overall scale to be reliable with an alpha of 0.85, as well as these subscales were both, were both reliable. Then we looked at criterion validity, which is, is it correlated with what we want it to predict? So we're hoping that people will see, a different, see different images and that based on these questions, it'll predict behavioral intention. This was an online study, so we couldn't test actual behavior, but it did significantly predict behavioral intention, the overall scale as well as both the subscales. And then finally, sensitivity. Is it sensitive to differences? So people in these studies saw um, four different images, and are there significant differences in this usability scale across these images? Versus everyone's just saying, everyone's just saying whatever they look at is Cool, like it, pretty, cool, like it, pretty. So we'd see high reliability because everybody's answering positively, but low sensitivity. And we did see that the scale was sensitive. So we pre these preliminary tests suggest that this scale is valid and reliable. We do need to test it um, in naturalistic settings. So to really fully validate this, a few more studies. This was the first one testing this scale. And then I also want to, um, I'm working right now to build a full model of instruments and, um, and scales to test this. So upscale is just the first piece and what we're hoping is a larger model of assessment of behavior-based energy. So when we look at a broader general discussion, we've looked at um, the taxonomy, really getting at what is this intervention and teasing a little bit into what are the differences and the variability and feedback. We looked a little bit at user experience, um, the meta-analysis, was really looking at some of the, the intervention-based mediators, so what's, or yeah, moderators, what's moderating this effectiveness. That feedback user paper, the naturalistic chapter, is looking at that for whom, who are these people that are using it, what is their user experience. Um, and, then, and then with this experience piece, we're looking at like how can we learn more about not just is feedback effective, but how and for whom is it effective. So while there are benefits to simplicity. I think that we need to be designing interventions and designing feedback that when people receive it is very simple and easy to understand and respond to, like that. Mm -hmm. um, on the back end, in our analysis, it might not be that simple. So I think while we want to present simple information to end users, we need to not be thinking a little bit more com complexly about how we design them. So thinking not just about is feedback effective, but again, how, who, what, when, where, and why is feedback effective. So things like what, so future and current research is looking at differences among what type of feedback, what amount, how much, when we go from 12 data points a year to 31 and a half million, um, or up to 6.3 trillion if we pull those electricity signatures, we tested, we did some analysis looking at seven versus 31 data points and found that when you go from here to here, you see significant changes. So when you go from seven to 31 and you see differences, what happens when you get to 31 billion if you're not careful? And also what message, as we said, there's lots of different ways to present information about how much, how much your, your washer is using. I can tell you how, much, how many kilowatts it uses a year, that it's 6% of your home, how much per load, or we can even translate to other more interesting messages that might get people with different motivations. I know that a double bacon, I know what a double bacon cheeseburger is, and that's about equivalent to a kilowatt hour. And then again, what outcome? So thank you so much, and I would welcome any questions at this time. And I want to just acknowledge so many, so many people in this room have contributed to this. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So we're going to uh, start our discussion session now, and I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Zoyer to comment, and uh, and then I'll invite Dr. Richard Matthew, and then I'll chime in a bit and open it up. All right, so I think you did a really great job. This is a very impressive body of work. Um, I actually had a little 
bit of trouble trying to find too many critiques of it, um, just from my, you know, experimental, social psychological point of view. But one thing that did, um, that that I did notice as I was reading this in your naturalistic usability or your user study, um, where you do have that additional category of the HVAC use, which you sort of indicates not really energy feedback, but you put it in there because looks like a little more than 10% of your sample has sort of said this was the energy feedback um, that they were considering when they were answering, when they were doing their answers. And I'm just wondering if you were to take out that that chunk, that 10% or so, that isn't really fitting into this idea of energy feedback that you have, does it have any kind of effect on the results in terms of the picture of the people that are using this or what they think of it, et cetera? Because I, I, I didn't see that as really fitting into you know, to the rest, even though obviously 10% of the people were confused about what energy feedback meant. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that we should, you know, let their confusion be part of, you know, make it look like we were confused. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. And we talked as like, I see nods because some of my, my collaborators on that project are, are in the room and, and we talked about that. Um, and I think what, and this one's actually not published yet. So this is something we can rerun those numbers and take a look at, which I don't think we did. Um, but my thought was, and I went back and forth on this a bunch, was that I was interested in the subjective user experience. Mm -hmm. And these people thought they were using something that they considered energy feedback. And a lot of people in this broader field will talk about programmable thermostats as feedback. Because it's giving you feedback about the temperature in the room. It's not giving you what my definition of energy feedback is in feedback about the energy consumption of that. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was our rationale for keeping it, possibly because it's a small sample, um, but also because the thought was, this was, do they think it's feedback, the subjective user experience of these people that think they are purchasing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kept them. We thought the same thing. We also thought about people who are just saying, well, I read my energy bill. They weren't really actively adopting. And everyone gets an energy bill. So some of those non-users, but they were viewing it. They were referring to themselves as a user of feedback. Um, and that's kind of where we went with that. And it is messy because it's naturalistic. Yeah. Um, and so I'll definitely rerun. I think that's a good suggestion to rerun those numbers and see yeah, if it I changes mean, it anything. It might just even be worth a footnote that, you know, when excluding these, you know, 10 participants who, you know, aren't really in the cleanest category, you know, there were no, it didn't significantly affect the results or, you know, or, or if it does, then maybe talking about those totally separately. But, um, yeah, I would... I would just want to make sure. I mean, it, it is only a handful of people, but you you only had 90 people who were, you know, who were reporting using this. So even 10 of those 90, you know, could, you know, could throw things off. So I think it's worth running in both ways. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Let me, uh, let me, let me first of all start off by saying that, that, uh, that, the whole thing strikes me as, as showing a very, um, very sophisticated use of statistical interpolation. So it's very competent. It, it's, it makes a clear contribution to the to the whole sort of feedback psychology domain. It, and, and and I think it's 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 at that level where it is or could be or or will be publishable in that domain because it, it's clearly a contribution. And it does what, what I think is very important in social, social ecology. It also has obvious real-world implications and value and utility. So it's sort of a, 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 a very good example of, of social ecology research that identifies, that, that, you know, identifies a problem that's a real-world problem and grapples with it in a way that is, is sophisticated intellectually but also um, useful. Um, so, so uh, as I guess that background, I want to suggest that there are some things that I would, would want you to consider as ways that, that might be low cost, relatively low cost ways of enriching the value of this to a broader community. So, so, so I, want to, I want to suggest a couple of things because I think this is a very um, well thought out, well conceived and, and even exuberant endorsement of, 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 of a position on the climate change solution set. So that's so that's very so so in that sense you know it's going to be it, it hasn't it has an audience um, but you know and I think this is one of the things that, that maybe maybe you could consider for chapter one maybe you don't even have to consider for this project maybe it's something later on 
um, when you, you know, present it or do something else. But, but clearly, that point on the solutions, that, that idea that efficiency is, is a linchpin in, in, in environmental rescue and dealing with climate change, is a position that has also a large body of critique. So there are lots of people who, who disagree with that position, who think that, that, that it is, it is, it is um, sort of sending the wrong message about the severity of, of the problem. So it's, it's speaking to a certain demographic, a sort of elite, upper class type of, of person, um, and, 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 and sort of suggesting that here's what we need to do to solve climate change. And there are people who think that, that's, that, that when we send that message, and so that, that's the wrong message. And so all, all I'm suggesting is that, is that approaches to dealing with climate change are much broader than efficiency. Efficiency is, is one of them, um, but it's not by any means all of them. And, and the reason that this is important is, is for example, you, you state that energy is abstract, is, is an abstract thing, and I think that for a certain demographic it is. Is it abstract for everyone? Um, I think a lot of the people it's not very abstract. I think for a lot of people it's extremely concrete. So when you demystify it for wealthy people, because it is abstract if you're a homeowner in Newport Beach, if you're collecting firewood in, in some other part, it's not that abstract. It's, it, it, it's made more concrete. Um, so, it, so the process of demystifying energy for a certain segment of society, I think is extremely valuable. I think it's important. But I think it's not people. It is a certain subsection of people. And even right. when you look at your group, the number of people in the world who make ninety to one hundred thousand dollars at the household level—you're talking about a very, very small group. So they are now being put into a very large role in environmental rescue, for being sort of a fraction of, of the planet. And that comes with some implications. And I, and I don't think the study is the place to address them, but rather just to acknowledge them. The first one is when you when you talk about technologies of production and consumption and, and ways we might alter them, adjust them, refine them, improve them. The, what the critics will say is that you're ignoring some important questions, and the reason you're ignoring those important questions is because you wouldn't like the answers. <coughs> and the, the, the important questions are that these have implications for technologies of meaning, how we understand the problem, technologies of, of sort of you know, control, how we decide to govern the problem, and ultimately technologies of self, what we think of as normal behavior, as normative behavior. For some reason, as a psychologist, it would, it would be great to, to, for me to see your reflections on the implications of something like this for identity, for, for how people understand what is normal behavior in a society, what is good behavior, what is normative behavior. Um, because it's behavior that a lot of people are never going to be eligible to, to, to meet, for example. Um, so, so the, uh, because, uh, you know, as we know, only, only a small number of people have residences in which it's possible to reduce to reduce energy use. Um, building on that a little bit, I think that, that, that uh, how, would, how would I say this? The, the other thing, so, so I would, it would be interesting for me to have your comments on what are some of the broader implications of aligning climate change response with efficiency and, and when that's only a very small group of people who, are, who you're really talking to. Um, so that would be one thing, just to reflect on, okay, is this, is, you know, are the critics right that this group, the last thing you want to be doing is telling this group that, that its role in environmental rescue is actually fairly painless. Is that the right message to be sending them, or are we reinforcing their baser instincts, you know, because that's what the critics will, might, might suggest about this research. And I think that where you, can, where you can really add value is by anticipating that and responding to it, mm -hmm. and simply saying, here's why this is an important thing to do, acknowledging that, it, that, that what I'm not talking about people in a way that's fully generalizable to everybody on the planet. I'm talking about people in a particular socioeconomic and cultural context. And they look very American and they look very upper class. Um, and that's who I'm talking about. And this is why I think motivating them, them in this way is valuable to the problematic of climate change and not sort of actually making it more complicated because the critique, I think, goes that, that we do this and we're just going to pay the price of environmental collapse and later than we would now because this doesn't actually solve the deeper problem, uh, you know, and so on. Um, the other thing that, because you're a psychologist and it would be interesting, is, is, is you focus largely on, on a certain set of feedback messages. And, and I would wonder, in this, all this research, did you, did you, did, did you ever think 
that there might be sort of radically different ways to provide feedback to people. Like just, just you know, ways in which people ha aren't necessarily doing it, but which might be much more effective in terms of this, this broader problem of climate change. Like, are, you know, are there other associations, or, or does it have to be so linear to work? Could, could, you, have, could you have a little bit more complicated routing for, for feedback to still have, uh, or would this be a way to, to make it accessible to other types of people, or to allow other people to participate in getting feedback messages from our energy economy, and so on? Um, so this is, this is a good way for somebody who's getting a monthly bill, and it's big, and they, they want to reduce it, and that sort of thing. But are there other ways that we can think of providing feedback about energy use, which might, be, which might uh, talk to other types of motivations and other types of aspirations that people have? Because I know that one of the things that you have is this broader sense of aspirational and motivational types of, of, of issues. And it just seems that this is begging to be connected to that in a way which, which ultimately deepens the personalization of your set of recommendations and conclusions. So that these are not, so that these are, these are a little bit impersonal. And I think that there's an opportunity to deepen the intellectual involvement of yourself in saying what have we really learned from all this? And how does it, how does ultimately this figure in to the larger issue that I'm concerned with, the relationship between technology and messaging and climate change. And so, I, I don't know if you want to do it in this study, but I, I think you want to do it ultimately is to weigh in on this bigger issue that you have about technology, about communications, about climate, and ask, is this, you know, is this the right way to be going? Is this the best way to be going? Are there other ways? Does this close other doors or problematize other things? What are the problems this creates as well as, well as what are the solutions it generates? And I think that, that you, of all people, should be able to to do that, to think, to, to put this in a broader universe of, 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 of sort of, you know, prescription for us than, than what the conclusion does. I would say the conclusion ends, that there's more that you could be writing about the potential value of this way of thinking and taking it to this point than you have done. You've closed, you, you've spoken very effectively to the feedback community, but I think that there's another few pages which would link it to a broader set of concerns about moving in this direction or not moving in this direction. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a lot of potential that with a little bit of effort would, would, would allow you to add an element of creativity to the end of this that links it to the big issues that you describe as your motivation for getting in here. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I actually, it's something I think about and isn't in there and I think I can work in is that um, what I often say when talking about it is that it's in, and I appreciate your comment about the kind of uh, ethnocentricism of the, of the approach, because in emerging markets, people are still very physi physiologically connected to resource use. Um, and so I often say it's actually modernism that disconnected us from resource use, and the information economy is what can reconnect us to the connections that, which, that have been lost. And so we see that with food, right? That, it's the microwaves and all of these things that have made food so easy that have disconnected us from the number of calories required to hunt and gather and prepare food, which is why we have these problems. And it's the same thing with energy. We're disconnected from the physical labor required to get this electricity because of the industrial revolution, because we're using concentrated energy. And so the information can reconnect us to that natural connection that's been lost. Mm -hmm. So in, in some ways, the, in, the information revolution corrects for the issues that were brought up by the Industrial Revolution. So to me, that speaks directly to the way in which a technology adjustment in the world of production and consumption has implications for technologies of meaning and identity. It speaks directly to that. And, and since that is a really interesting thing, which would also sort of anticipate people who are saying, you're just telling these people that all they need to do is make, that they, their lifestyle is not going to be shaken. That all they have to do is, is, is put a little device in their home and they're playing their role. But what you're really trying to say is I'm going to, oh, I'm going to connect them to a deeper understanding of, of their links to nature. And that's a whole different thing. And I think it's worth, I think it's worth exploring. Yeah, thank you. It's what's interesting to me, and, it's, and what's interesting is that I didn't put it in it at all. That <laughs> um, I, I talk about it that way, and I don't write about it that way. So thank you. So as I read across 
your chapter and the different research strategies that you've brought together. I saw a lot of strengths, a lot to like. I, I think you mastered uh, and integrated several different mixed methods from meta-analysis to surveys to archival data analysis and content analysis of uh, feedback device characteristics. Um, you integrated subjective as well as objective data uh, reflecting different aspects of feedback. Um, so there are a lot of sort of social ecological themes methodologically, theoretically you've tried to contextualize the meaning of feedback and when it's affected. Uh, at the same time, as I've mentioned to you, um, looking across, there, there are issues that you haven't addressed. Richard and Joanna pointed out some of those. Um, so I just want to uh, suggest a few others to think about and as you go forward, whether it's for this project or later. Uh, first, in terms of energy policy effectiveness, you know, one could think about, well, where should we put our research dollars or invest our resources to kind of solve that, that issue of climate change. And so one category might be supply side, improve technologic efficiency, or move people toward alternative sustainable technologies, whether that's urban farming or biofiltration or solar panel installation. Uh, the other being demand side, you know, efficiency, trying to enhance through feedback and other strategies, uh, increased efficiency, which can capture a lot of savings and to some extent environmental improvement. So on the demand side, and you lay out in your first chapter why there's good rationale to put effort there in terms of what can be uh, harnessed. Um, one can think about pre-behavioral interventions. You mentioned feed forward, for example, that uh, perhaps activate, try to cultivate certain values and the ways in which those values anchor certain attitudes and beliefs and ultimately lead to certain kinds of behavior. Um, so feedback can be quite different depending on whether it's linked, as you point out in your dissertation, to incentive systems or not. Or it can be different depending on whether you bring up um, socially descriptive norms or prescriptive norms as part of the feedback, whether it's social feedback. <coughs> so I think you know those are some issues that could be thought, you know, uh, Richard was saying, how can you make feedback uh, that much more powerful or uh, frame it a little bit differently in terms of a typology of some of those dimensions of feedback. Um, so to what extent does the post-behavioral strategy, which is uh, after someone behaves, giving them feedback, is that the best, is, is that where we should put our energy, our resources? Should we put it on pre-behavioral kinds of interventions or some combination of those? Um, and, and if so, how might those be leveraged or implemented? Um, so those are a few issues that I thought about, you know, going forward. I think, um, you know, there's an opportunity to elaborate on some of these things in your closing chapter, which brings together your your different uh, research strategies and findings, or it's something that could be tackled in a future project. But I just wanted to mention those for you know, some things to think about, uh, because the the feedback uh, approach is really post behavioral, and, and some would say, well, that's that's great, that's very effective. Uh, as long as people pay attention to it and they understand it and they, they process it. But, you know, a lot of social psychologists, for example, or people in that environmental attitudes research might say, well, wait a minute, you know, what about the consistency among these values and beliefs and attitudes? How do we shape those up in the service of certain behaviors and uh, link those or yoke those with feedback strategies? Mm -hmm. And I think that, and I think that there's a little bit of that there, but that isn't described sufficiently, um, where these antecedent or pre-intervention strategies like encouraging people to set goals was a moderator, for example, in the meta-analysis and was touched upon, but I don't think I addressed it head on in a discussion format. So I think that what you're getting at, there's definitely a line of that throughout the empirical work that I just didn't connect. Yeah. So I can definitely pull that in a little bit in the beginning and then pick that up a little bit in the end in how um, and it's interesting because we we talk about it as you know before and after, but really like you can't catch somebody before they've ever used energy, you know, unless they're still we have a few fetuses in the room, but you know, unless once we kind of come out of the womb, we are using. So we're always we're in this system of using of using resources, right, of consuming resources. So in some ways, it's almost a false dichotomy of like antecedent and consequence, but at the same time, it's important to think about before that behavior, before turning on your TV tonight but one versus 
one can pose that question yeah. about where to put the resources and effort, even uh, notwithstanding the issues that Richard mentioned about you know vast cultural and economic differences in terms of the meaning of feedback and efficiency. Let's say sticking within a modernist system, one of their vulnerabilities is that their uh, you know our complex energy grids and, and uh, infrastructures are so vulnerable to intermittency to collapse. And so one might say, well, we need to ready the population by kind of encouraging them to go in some new directions, to decentralize and, and do urban farming or do, you know, things they can do more locally so that they're not just, um, that their sustainability behavior is not just in, in the context of the mega infrastructure. So those are, you know, th that's not something you're going to, that you should have addressed in the dissertation, obviously, but in terms of how to frame your work, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of these broader issues, it's something that yeah. And then li listening to all this is making me think more about, um, you know, what we've learned together through doing the meta-analysis about, you know, feedback and the different kinds of, I'm always been especially interested in the things like the motivational and the, you know, are you meeting your goal or, is, you know, are you doing better than your neighbor and all this kind of competition um, or at least goal setting, um, which I think there's not enough research. You know, there are a few studies that kind of did that, but, you know, as we saw, it wasn't even really enough to be able to talk very much about the meta-analysis. And one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, this, this question that you just asked Richard about, you know, is are there ways that feedback isn't even being given that we could, we could start giving it and having this antecedent versus, you know, just a, a consequence is something like a goal setting where you get some sort of warning when you're sort of, you know, not meeting your goal or when you're about to exceed your this, your goal of energy use for the day, right? For example, our, you know, our, our when on our cell phones, for example, when we're low on batteries, right? It gives us, it makes this little noise and it says, you know, you're down to 20%, you better plug in. Well, what if we all had a goal for how much each day we wanted to use for, you know, energy in our home and when we're getting close to that goal, we get some sort of notification on our cell phone that says, you know, you've almost used up enough energy for the day, you better, you know, better slow down. And that's uh, the, this kind of feedback that that no system, as far as I know, is giving yet, right? It's giving how much have you been using, but no alert prior to not meeting your goal to let you know, like, here's how you're doing on this goal for the day or for the week in a way that could modify behavior before it's too late, right? Feedback after you've done it, okay, well, next time I'll do better. Well, how about... How about giving us the feedback in the process so today we do better? Yeah, and, and, there, and I think that there are a couple newer technologies that are starting to do that. And that's why, to me, this is such exciting research and such exciting time to be doing it, is that almost every day when I listen to NPR, I hear something about the Internet of Things, this future in which we are all connected and everything's measured. And that's kind of what we're what this is connected to. We're hearing a lot this morning. I heard something about these, you know, fit bands and jawbone ups and yeah. tracking everything that we do. Um, Google that discontinued the power meter four years later bought Nest, which is an automated um, home learning thermostat for over a billion dollars. And so this is, I think, the direction we're going in. And there's a lot of really innovative stuff going on in the tech sector. And as sometimes happens, research tends to be, the research community is testing solutions that are far outdated as compared to what's really going on. And so I'm trying to, yeah, figure out how to, but I think that, but the, these startups contact us because they know that, the psycholo that getting the psychology right is so important. So they're designing things decades beyond what we're studying, and then asking us to inform their development. So there's this really interesting temporal gap um, that I'm, I'm in the middle of and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about, and I think your comments are all getting it, uh, my issue of how, where, where, I, where we fit in as academics, where, how and where can I and do I fit in, and I'm figuring that out. And so these are all really great comments for that. And, and when I said creative new ways of thinking about feedback, I have in mind this sort of stuff, not necessarily capturing what's been done experimentally, but sort of more modalities, like, right. like we could think of uh, feedback in a completely different way, linked to this, or coming at this time, or being delivered through this sure. system, yeah. rather than just suggesting this was the only way to feedback. Because I, I just think that, that this, is, this is a platform for allowing that creative moment where you say, you know, why limit ourselves to one modality of feedback? There's no real obvious reason to do that. 
technology allows us to, you could have sensors in people's clothes that give them wild shots when they use too much energy. So <laughs> that would cause heart attacks or something like that. I mean, that would, that would slow down energy. But the point is that there's lots of other ways. And, 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 and that, so I was thinking more of, of, of modalities rather than just capturing what, is, what, what they're doing in an engineering labs at, Cal, yeah. at Caltech. And I think that that you could do. Mm-hmm. Even though it's hard to stay abreast of what the real world engineers are figuring out. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any mm-hmm. other comments from the committee members? We'd like to open it up for discussion with all of you. If you have comments, suggestions, questions. I have a really specific <laughs> question. <laughs> I, um, so, you know, the, I've seen you show me the um, receipt picture before and mm-hmm. like a way of explaining your research. And I kind of wondered if maybe you can think of more think about different modalities of engaging in this type of work and of giving feedback and thinking about um, that. So I, I was wondering when that happened for you or what happened or who brought it in and when you kind of said, because I feel like that was kind of, it, it feels to me like a bit of an aha, one of the aha moments in the research. So, and it. That specific analogy? It, I do. It was uh, so the the first reference was made by Kempton and Lean in 1984, and so a lot of people pick it up. I love it. I think it just gives it's, it gives us something to anchor on that we can understand. Um, for me, the the aha and when I became interested in this was, uh, and I could pinpoint the exact day, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. But it was spring of 2009, and it was when Google.org, which is the philanthropic arm of Google released a press release in their blog that day, they announced Power Meter. Um, And I remember reading that, and they said, um, Google is going to link with utilities and give you this information. So I didn't glom on to the supermarket analogy, but this idea that, and Google, and they said, Google is now going to work with utilities and give you day, you know, use during the day and blah, blah, blah. And I thought that was so cool. I was scrambling to come up with a topic for this meta-analysis course. Um, and then it, it linked, the, the press release linked to uh, the most cited probably paper in this area, which is a 2006 paper by a great researcher at Oxford, Sarah Darby, um, that was a qualitative literature review, um, <clears throat> self-published. It was a white paper that came out of the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford. And, um, and, and again, it wasn't incredibly empirically rigorous. It was like, I kind of looked around, and here's what I found. Um, and it was the most cited paper in this area. And I, and I thought, um, wow, there's a lot of potential here to drill in. Um, as we're seeing this internet of things just over the horizon, we're spending. And that same year, uh, or was 2009 or 2010, was when the stimulus package allocated $4 billion to the smart grid. So we see this enormous amount of money. The expected cost of this transition to the smart grid is $165 billion just in the US. And so we're changing the global infrastructure around energy. And people are so excited about the potential of it. And then there's the broad public that doesn't care at all. Um, and. Uh, and so it just seemed like, gosh, this is a place where I could contribute. Because there's so much potential. And there's so much that we know in social science that's not being applied at all. Like, here's this academic community. And here's these people that are going out doing this stuff in the real world. And, I, and it didn't seem like there was a lot of translation. Um, and so that was really, I guess, the light bulb for me was seeing, like, this, seeing Google getting involved. Because I was interested in technology and the role of technology in pro-social behavior. And this was like, how could you get better, bigger than Google getting into energy use? So that was the, the big kind of click. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just, I, I mean, it's, it's actually very exciting to see where you've come to with your research. So I'm thrilled to be here at this moment with you. But um, I, I'm, uh, in my outside school life, I work with uh, a sustainability group locally in my community. and. One of the issues that we talk about a lot as a problem and as, as like a um, advocacy problem is that as a as a person who is inclined to do the right thing and to make a difference, you don't really know wh- what are the the, the big ta- tag items versus the small tag items. So you know, plugging in your iron 
might not be a really significant gesture. Um, and, and so some of those things, you know, like people get very excited about solar energy use, but it doesn't make sense necessarily on the individual homeowner level. Um, so there's, a, there's an impulse to do something, but you're not necessarily directed towards making those big contribution changes. So for example, you know, everybody gets all excited about low gas mileage cars, but in fact, if you don't buy a new car, you probably save more energy than if you bought a low mileage car. So I'm wondering, given the framework that you've been working in, how your research can make a contribution towards helping people understand those kinds of choices. Yeah, that's a um, yeah, that's a that's a great comment, and um, and I think I mean I think that's one of the the keys the key benefits of, of this is that um, and I really like the way the the White House and the Green Button Initiative frames it um, because of course they're trying to be a little more bipartisan and so it's not like we're going to give you this information so you turn off your lights when you leave a room it's you have a right to know what's going on in your home. Just like, you know, just like that grocery store, everything is using energy. And you have a right to know what you don't need to turn off as much as what you do need to turn off. That, that when armed with data, just like the United States government mandates that packaged food includes nutritional information, shouldn't the electricity, as we're investing billions of dollars into the smart grid, should we, shouldn't we conversely be allowed to have access to that information rather than it being seen as a pejorative intervention that the government is and utilities are giving you this data in order to get you to do something that you can look at it as, well, I have a right to know what's going on so that I can make better decisions. Now, of course, how that information is presented and some of the work we've done that's not in this dissertation shows that when you present information in different ways, there are ways of framing information that's more likely to get people to act and then there's ways of framing information that's going to raise awareness, and those might not be the same. Um, and so it's important that, that we think about what is the goal. Is the goal to educate people? Because you can create passive systems. You can just create a smart home that ignores the occupant so that you don't need to be like constantly paying attention to what's on and off and, and going. But is the goal for us to be better, and this is what Richard was getting at, is the goal for us to kind of be better connected to resource use? to kind of use this as an opportunity to remind us that fossil fuels are literally organic matter? Is this an opportunity to do that, to connect us to what it means to be human, to what it means to be alive, to what it means to be a part of this system? Or is it just a way to cut carbon emissions as part of this portfolio that includes solar and wind? Um, and so I think there are these big questions about what is the goal. Um, of feedback because you can present information in a way that gives people that data or you can kind of simplify it to get as many people to do as many of the behaviors that you want them to do as possible. Um, but I think that ideally we are using this so that people can identify the real footprint of their actions. And I think that goes beyond the scope of this project. I know I was working, um, I was brought in to consult on a zero net energy project a couple years ago in Palm Springs, and they were looking at the zero net, the energy use of the homes. But this was a retirement community. And I thought, but what about how much they're moving and leaving? What about these other things of a zero net life is not the same as a zero net home? Um, and that might get beyond the scope of this specific dissertation, but it's definitely, um, something I'm grappling with in kind of the broader implications of my work and future steps. Does that answer address? Yeah, no, I like the zero net life. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, that really does get to that, that question that I, was, that I was grappling with. And, you know, thinking about, for example, when we are trying to be um, thoughtful consumers and we purchase um, low energy use um, appliances, but we don't actually know how much energy goes into making those appliances, which is another part of that. Yeah. Consumers of energy. And this is specifically looking at direct energy electricity. So the embedded or indirect energy and all the things that we use, like our televisions, is not incorporated in a direct kilowatt hour cost. But I think ideally there, there are other ways to incorporate that. But then it gets really compli complex. You get that kind of brain melt stuff. But th this is why I think psychologists are important to have involved. Um, because we need to think about not just how many data points can we put in, but how do we make that palatable or interpretable. Chrissy, you had something? Yeah. So Kristen. Great job, Beth. Um, 
my first thought on this is we're looking at direct energy, but there's so much in the life cycle before it, like <coughs> you were mentioning. Um, but then we also have this energy, water, and nexus. And I was wondering, do you think these applications with this feedback and the information access could be transferred into the water realm for water use? I know there's a lot going on, but do you think that the same principles and the same water feedback technology could be there to help kind of tie the use between water and energy? And then could you even take it back of, because you use this many fewer gallons per day, or say you get down to the below the 100, would that be something that could then tie back into the energy? Like, do you think that, are you seeing it going in that direction? Do you think the psychological dimensions would be the same, or do you think it'd be so vastly different because we can see the water that comes out of our tap, we can see all of those actual interactions with our water, even though we don't see the source or where it goes? Um, no, it's a great question. I think I think psychologically it's very similar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're drinking water because we're thirsty, not because we want fish to die. Um, and so, so that idea of kind of linking self-relevant self goals to consumption of something that's kind of a commodity is important. On the technological side, I think electricity is easier than water, which is why more people work on it. Um, but there are some folks, John Froelich, who's at the University of Maryland, is doing some stuff where they're measuring the uh, the frequency of water coming out, like the waves. Um, that are coming that are coming out of the pipes to disambiguate, so you can pull from one water main and tell that this is the upstairs toilet and the downstairs, and this is the shower. Um, so there there is some work being done on that. There is less work in water than there is in electricity, um, but I think it's definitely there's some research, and definitely a lot of this will apl can apply to other domains to things like the indirect energy use in the food we eat. I mean, there are lots of, it, it's the technical of how do you get when you eat something, you know, how would you get the carbon? That's more like Dan was talking about the antecedent feed forward, because it's harder for you to eat a steak and have your plate tell you, you just yeah. consumed, you know. Um, but I think in water, that is one where not only psychologically, but technologically, you, there are a lot of strong corollaries, and it can be extended. Some of the committee uh, needs to lead it. So they're going to come back in. Yeah. I still have edits. But I'm not going to work on that tonight. I hope so. She walked already. And I think I told most of the folks that are that are here.